Hi and welcome to Malicious Life. This week we have a slightly different episode for you, an interview with Dave Kennedy, aka Relic, aka Hacking Dave, a world-class expert on social engineering. I talked with Dave about the psychological principles behind social engineering techniques and about the social engineering toolkit that he created to help people test and harden their organization's defenses against these kinds of attacks. Dave is a fantastic speaker who knows how to tell great stories, so I'm sure you'll enjoy this discussion. I'll see you on the other side of the interview. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to Malicious Life. Today we have Dave Kennedy as a guest. Uh, Dave Kennedy is a cybersecurity expert who created several popular open source tools, notably the Social Engineer Toolkit, also known as SET, SET. He is also one of the founding members of the Penetration Testing Execution Standard, PTES, the industry leading standard and guidelines on penetration tests. He is the founder of DerbyCon, one of the largest security conferences in the world. He's also the founder of Trusted Sec, cybersecurity consulting company, and BDS, a monitoring and detection company. On a side note, he consulted on hacker techniques for the hit TV show, Mr. Robot. Maybe you'll tell us a bit about that experience in a second. Welcome to Malicious Life, Dave. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, good, good to be here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I've got to say that personally, I'm very excited because you're the first mud player <laughs> that I've had the pleasure <laughs> to talk to other than myself in the last, I think, 20 years even. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, miss, I miss my mudding days. I miss my mudding days, that's for sure. Yeah, for listeners who have no idea what we're talking about, since we're talking about things from the 1980s and early, uh, I don't know, early nine, uh, late 80s and early 90s of the internet, well, t- tell us a bit about what a mud is, just for our listeners to understand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So uh, MUDs were, were what we call multi-user dimensions. And uh, before we had graphics on computers, uh, we had we had text. And so the earlier days, we had these, these systems called bulletin board systems or BBSs. And uh, you would dial in from your computer um, into these uh, uh, BBSs, these bulletin board systems, and play with other people, uh, kind of its earlier form of the, the World Wide Web. And uh, you'd sit there and you'd play these 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 text-based games that were role-playing games and space games and things like that. Um, I played a few Legends of the Red Dragon, uh, Trade Wars, another one called Tellerina, uh, Lands of Chaos, a lot of player versus player type type uh, games. And uh, so I, that's how I actually started getting into to computers was by playing these mods and learning how to type fast and learning how to you know, type north, type east, you know, kill person, uh, go kill this thing, bash this thing. All text. Cast spell, all text. You know, all, all text. Yeah, <laughs> Sounds no graphics at so all. <laughs> awkward today, <laughs> but it was great fun. Yeah. I hate to tell you how many thousands of hours of my life was wasted, were wasted on uh, <laughs> on mud. Oh, yeah, I almost, I almost got out of high school because I used to play with mud. So, I, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun for me. And uh, I actually took one over and uh, started coding for it. And that's how I, I picked up... Uh, uh, C and C++ uh, early on in my, in my kid years uh, was taking over a, a mud and helping helping run it. So it was useful as well, not just wasteful as in my case. <laughs> okay, yeah, so yeah, enough uh, nostalgia for uh, one interview. Uh, we're going to talk about today mostly about social engineering. So for newbie listeners, uh, let's define in, in a few sentences what is social engineering? You know, to me, social engineering is, is a... Um, a, a way of, of deceiving somebody in order to get a desired outcome. And, uh, and, and social engineering can be applied to anything in life, uh, whether it's uh, uh, getting your wife to, to say okay to something and, and buying a, a brand new TV or, you know, being able to rip into uh, security systems through, you know, targeted spear phishing or calling somebody up on the phone or doing certain things that, that may uh, be, appear to be something else uh, when, you're, when you're doing something different. And so social engineering is really just manipulating somebody uh, to do somebody and understanding how humans uh, react, how they behave, uh, the psyche behind that, and, and really trying to figure out how you can get a desired outcome by influencing a person to do something different. 
in a sense, exploiting bugs in the human operating system. That's uh, the definition Absolutely, that I once yes. read. You're, you're, going after, you're going after the human. And I think that most experts would agree that the, probably the best defense is training, is having users uh, recognize threats, recognize attacks. And once you know that uh, somebody is using a social engineering technique against you, you you are basically protected you know how you, you once you recognize the threat it, it mostly in most cases you will uh, know how to uh, protect against it so uh, in this yeah. spirit uh, i want to uh, give examples to our listeners of various uh, social engineering techniques uh, for that goal i'll use uh, uh, let's say in 1984 there was a psychologist called robert caldini who published a book called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. And in that book, he describes six key principles of persuasion. And these principles are also regarded as the basic ideas behind social engineering. So let's go over them one after the other and give examples, if you can, of how they might be used in social engineering attacks. When I first started off in the security industry, uh, I was extremely technical. And I'm still very technical in nature. I like, I like computers. I like coding. I like figuring out new ways around systems. But if you look at, at, at how hard it is to learn that information and to develop, like, let's just say, exploits or zero days, uh, you know, that's exciting for me. But what's also exciting on the social engineering piece is that what you're trying to accomplish is to create a scenario uh, that is believable to the other person to where you're not raising any suspicion or alarms. And, and why that's important to understand is that you're essentially creating a fantasy. You're creating something that's completely ridiculous, completely uh, uh, made up and fake, and you're trying to get this user to perform some sort of action or give you some sort of information to be able to do it. And so I'll give you an example of, of both success and fails. Uh, we, one of our our consultant, Larry Spawn, a uh, great, great consultant, one of the, the best red teamers and pen testers on our, on our, on our, on our team, uh, runs our whole force practice. Uh, he is fantastic at hacking into systems, but he's really bad at social engineering. Uh, and, it, and it is an art. You have to have confidence. You, you don't want to trip anybody up. You want to sound like you're helping them out. You don't want to be mean. There's uh, a you bit know, of acting people, oh, in social engineering. It, it, exactly right. You're, you're an actor. You're an actor. And uh, you might, might have a good movie career, too. You never know. <laughs> But Larry was on a, an engagement, and uh, it was it was for this uh, uh, retail store. And so we, uh, I gave Larry the like we, we we found somebody that was their their head of IT uh, network engineering, and we spoofed their phone number coming from the, their their corporate offices to one of these retail stores. And this is like a retail store you can go into a mall and you can walk into the mall and basically go into these stores. And we said, hey, we're going to be having somebody from corporate come over, and we're going to be. Um, the whole pretext of the, the attack that we were going to leverage was, hey, we're going to be having somebody come over and, and uh, upgrade your, your infrastructure there to get faster internet and new devices and things like that. So, so just escort these people um, to the back and go max it to the, to the server room that's back there and the point of sale systems, and they're going to be doing all these upgrades. And so this is the whole pretext. I, I laid it out for Larry for his first social engineer engagement. And so I mapped everything out. I got the person's name. I had, I had him spoof in. Right before Larry starts to get on the phone, you can see he's like sweating. He's, his face is all red. You know, he's super scared. And he gets on the phone and it's a train wreck, right? He, he sounds so bad. He sounds so nervous. He sounds like he can't communicate uh, to somebody. And he's throwing up red alarms everywhere. But the funny part was, is it, it still worked. <laughs> it still worked. Like, like Larry's on the phone, his voice is cracking. He's, he's sweating. He sounds, you know, it sounds like, like, like literally not a legit person. And the other person on the line is like, oh, okay, cool. No problem. Sounds good. We'll see you in a little bit. And we walk into the retail store. <laughs> so, and we, we got an access to the back and everything else they were able to do. So sometimes it's really easy. Uh, sometimes it's really difficult. Uh, we had we had one. This is one of my favorite uh, spear phishing attacks that, that I've ever done. It was a manufacturing company, and they were uh, celebrating uh, 50 years of, of being in, in, in the United States, being an American-made company and all this other stuff. And it was all over their website. And I, I made the 50-year mark uh, of just like, uh, not, not reveal who the company is. And um, and so the, if you go to their website, you see all this information about how they're so proud about you know, 50 years of business and I mean, they get back to the community and all this other stuff. And so I sent an email and I created a fake domain like mediaprnews.com. And I said, hey, you know, we're really interested to, to the PR person. Uh, hey, we're really interested in doing a story uh, about your organization in 50 years uh, in business. We're, we're, you know, we're really excited about it. Uh, we want to do a story and all sorts of stuff. And I got a response back immediately uh, from the, the individual that was in charge of PR and uh, said, we'd love to do a story and everything else. And I actually didn't want to use uh, that person as a way to the spearfish. I wanted to target somebody else. And so what, what I got from just an email was, 
how the email set up, their colors, their fonts, their, their confidentiality information at the bottom, how to structure an email that makes it look legit with inside this organization. And so then I sent an email out to only two people, two people, and it was a, a, an email from the PR person uh, to two employees um, that had elevated access in their environment. And uh, I said to them, hey, we're, re- we're really excited about uh, being in business for 50 years. We're going to give away the new iPhone, uh, two free iPhone Xs. Um, as part of it, we're going to give away, I'm sorry, 50 free iPhone Xs um, to randomly selected individuals. And so uh, it, it may sound ridiculous, but we made it look super believable in every way, shape, or form. And these two people immediately logged in uh, to the site, gave us their information. We got code execution on the machines. Uh, and then what the funny part was, though, is that they started forwarding it to their friends. And their friends started clicking on it and entering their information, and it blew up like wildfire. We had like 250 submissions from two people that we tried to, to, to send this fish to. It like blew like wildfire. So we were a little bit too good, which was actually bad because we got caught. And so they, they shut us down. They, they stopped all of our – they made everybody reset their passwords. Well, the funny part was that the next day when all this happened, uh, we got an email from an individual – Saying, you know, because when you went to the site, it would say this has been blocked. There's been viruses on this 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 this, uh, this, this uh, uh, website. This is malicious. I mean, somebody emailed us because they didn't block the actual email domain and said, "My stupid IT people uh, blocked the domain. Is there any oh. way I can still get my free iPhone?" <laughs> oh man! And literally, we just directed them to a new site. <laughs> you know, <what> I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so well, you're good. The, the, the fish come to, to the spear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, let's say that I got the story correct. I mean, you sent the email as if it's coming from the company's own uh, uh, PR guy, right? Correct. So yep, exactly. this is an example, if I get it correctly, of one of the, uh, uh, the key uh, the basic six ideas of persuasion that I, we talked, I described earlier, which is authority. Authority is a very big uh, persuasion point. Uh, there's a lot of times where I'll be walking into a building and uh, what I'll do is, is I'll, if the, the, the let's just say the, the business attire there is like casual um, or business casual, a lot of times I'll dress up in a full suit and I'll pretend I'm on the cell phone to be important and then just piggyback into the, the organization. People looking at you like, well, hey, he's supposed to badge in, but he looks like he's important. So I'm not going to say anything and just let it go because he looks like he's important. That could be used in a lot of different scenarios where... You know, you're, you're a position of authority uh, that people will not question you as much as if you, you were, you know, uh, somebody of not, of, uh, not of authority. So it, it really does play a big difference on the roles that you play, the actor that you're being, um, and, and the type of things you've done. I mean, we've, we've done everything from dressing up as, um, as utility companies and, and performing, you know, assessments on the site itself or electrical problems or things like that to uh, actually dressing up as like full doctors and getting into to operating rooms. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different scenarios that you can play depending on the, the type of attack that you're performing. Uh, same thing, I guess, if you're, uh, uh, if you're masquerading as an IT guy and saying something like, go to this and that website or whatever. Over the phone, it's rather easy to, to use that authority if you manage to persuade the other side. Yeah, roles, like HR, HR benefits, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sales, uh, specific invoice, or um, one of my favorite ones I did live on, on CNN. Uh, Lori Siegel was the producer, and I can send you the link if you want to send it to the show notes, but uh, I did a live hack on TV where uh, I called up the help desk and the whole function and role of the help desk is to help. And human beings are extremely compassionate people. If, if you, there's a problem in most cases, other than like the gray beards that run the main mainframe uh, folks that, you know, that usually aren't, aren't too, too nice in some cases, um, you, you have, um, you have people that will typically help you And the help desk role for, from a functionality perspective is really to help you. So what I did for the help desk is I called them up and I said, Hey, I, I need you to, I, I'm really having a really difficult time getting to this site that I need to do for a big customer proposal. I'm in sales. I, I'm really not computer tech savvy. I don't know what I'm really doing here. Can you help me out? And the IT person went directly to the website um, that I asked them to go to. And in there we had a, a, a module that did code execution and we were able to compromise the IT help desk person's computer, which had elevated access. So, you know, the, the roles play a big difference in, in how you craft your, your scenarios and your situations. And it really depends on, on what you're trying to emulate. And that's the, the fun part about this industry and, and social engineering in general is that you're essentially creating zero days for human beings. You're creating a way to create a fantasy that, that you have to act on and, and uh, ways to make it look believable that, that help you 
uh, get to the, the goal that you want to go to. And whether that's dressing up as a utility person or a doctor or sending an email or calling somebody up on the phone, uh, it, it really, the, the believability factor is, is what people's willingness to help authority and, and the um, way to influence folks. I'm sure many of our listeners are now running through their heads different scenarios in, in which they were present and thinking about how easy it is to, to fall for this, for this technique. I mean, it's so natural to fall for this, these kinds of stuff. So, Knowing them is, is very, very important. Uh, how about uh, the, key, the key idea of reciprocity? Ask something, uh, ask a favor and return a favor as a way to persuade someone to help you. Uh, you're doing something for him and he's doing something for you as a social yep. engineering yeah. technique. The reciprocal, reciprocal like um, uh, ways of communication for, for benefits, right? So, exactly. And, and so... For, for us uh, uh, in social engineering specifically, uh, that, is, that is very desirable. Like if you can, can perform an action and you get rewards for those, uh, what's interesting is like gift cards are a great example. Uh, you can, if you fill out this survey, you'll get a $5 gift card to Starbucks. Now what we found with, with gift cards specifically is we'll actually give real gift cards when we're doing social engineering. We'll give them real $5 or $10 gift cards when they fill out these surveys for us um, because it entices an action to actively go and do. And uh, we found, though, that, that you can't, like, make up, like, large numbers. Like, hey, we'll give you 100 bucks because that's super suspicious. Your company is going to give you 100 bucks to, to go fill out a survey. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, $5 or something like that uh, is usually something that, that will entice people to go and do something. But things that you can um, exchange with or communicate with in a way um, that is mutually beneficial to them, uh, like, if you're in a position of power, uh, if, you're, if you're pretending to be in a, in a position of power, um, ways of, of, of rewarding that person, like, oh, thanks so much, you know, I'm going to make sure that uh, – you know, so-and-so in your management chain uh, gets a heads up of this nice job. Uh, ways that you can benefit people are, are very, very beneficial um, uh, to social engineering for sure. Yeah, how about scarcity, uh, limited time offers and such? Uh, that's a very powerful drive for social engineering, right? Yeah, um, so limited times are, are – are, so one thing that we, we try to do uh, very heavily is, is create a sense of urgency. And urgency is, is important because we don't want to sit there for six months waiting for somebody to click something. So – Things that, that can might be like, hey, if you don't fill this specific privacy policy out, you know, within 24 hours, your, your, your health care is going to um, have some issues and, and you may be, you know, you, it may, may lapse and you have to re-roll into our, our program and things like that. Anything that you can do to create a, a sense of urgency um, will ultimately help you out. Like, uh, I know some of the earlier techniques were like, hey, you know, your computer, we're seeing some suspicious activity from your computer. Um, can you, can, can we, uh, you know, hop in and give us some information about the system itself? Uh, those types of things. But Anything that you can do to, to create a sense of urgency on, a, on, on an individual to take an action so they don't, they don't forget uh, is important. There's also timing as well. Uh, in the morning is a great time so that when they wake up, they are going through their emails. Uh, you can hit them in that early early stage or after lunch before they're about to leave and check their last set of emails. Um, there's timing that's involved. There's, there's uh, uh, urgency that, that needs to be created. A lot of those can really play into your success factors when it comes to, to social engineering. I think that if you, if you notice as a victim, if you notice uh, urgency, that definitely uh, should ring a bell. I mean, that, that's a, a very good mark that you're being attacked. Uh, personally, the only time I almost fell for a phishing attack was when I got a link pretending to be a mail from Amazon saying something like your account has been breached or something like that. Uh, if you if you uh, approve the, the the account or something like that within half an hour from this mail or something, everything will be re- reset or something. And when you have like only half an hour and you received that email like 20 minutes ago, uh, you don't have that much time to check and, and see that everything is fine. So if there's urgency involved, be extra cautious, let's say. Yeah, it, urgency is, is a very clear indicator um, that something is going on, that something uh, is, is, is an issue. Your, your, your HR folks aren't going to send you a message uh, for urgency saying your benefits are going to expire within a day. And if they do, you, you contact them directly. If you haven't seen any previous notifications of things, those are also key signs. Um, it's, it's, it's important to understand that, that one of the, the biggest tools that we have in social engineering is that urgency piece. Uh, and, and if you can just take a step back and say, man, this doesn't seem right, uh, there's, there's probably something, something up here and just taking a look at the email stuff, you can probably spot, uh, ones pretty quickly. Like there was one recently I got hit with, um, that was, uh, uh hey, there's a new voicemail, uh, that you have. And you know, it, it came from, from Office 365, which we don't use Office 365. And we got a, 
notification from Office 365 saying there's a new voicemail for you. I'm like, hmm, maybe somebody sent me this uh, voicemail through their, their Office 365 and this way of sharing it. But I was like, this seems kind of fishy. So I started investigating and taking a look at it, and it was obvious, an obvious uh, 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 spoof site. So there's, there are things that, that may not create urgency, but, hey, maybe I have a voicemail to entice me to listen to and clicking on a link. Uh, those types of things can have a big impact as well. But, but urgency is, is almost typically... Uh, the the biggest way for us as as attackers to uh, to, to get somebody to click on something or to, to give us information. Yeah, I think uh, I mean we didn't cover all the six key principles of persuasion, but I think our listeners are now getting a good picture of how the basic ideas of social engineering can be uh, exploited. The basic key ideas. Malicious Life is sponsored by Cyber Reason, a cybersecurity company. If you're into cybersecurity, and since you're listening to our show, there's a good chance you are, I don't think I need to tell you about the problem of logs. We've all had that experience. Something's off in the network. Perhaps something malicious is going on. So you grab the logs and start browsing around for signs of foul play. But even a one megabyte log file is roughly 500 pages of text or a good-sized book. It's the classic needle in the haystack problem. What you need is a system that can not only detect threats in the network, but also screen false positives and show you the important stuff. In other words, what you need is a system that gives you a story. Jeffrey Wright, a cybersecurity manager at RTI Surgical, knows exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I'm Jeff Wright. I'm an RTI Surgical. We are a medical device company. We actually manufacture medical devices. I am the primary person responsible for security at RTI. I've been in the game since the 90s, since dial-up modems. It's great to be technical and it's to be great to be log-driven, but when you start trying to talk to someone that doesn't understand security at all, all they really want is a story. They, you know, It's all about visual aids. But we didn't have anything that really was piping on the whole concept of ransomware, ransomware, ransomware. And I felt that CyberReason did that for me. It added a layer of security that we just didn't have. It added that visibility to the endpoints when they're not in the office, which was a big deal for me. I was very impressed with not only the product, but the biggest thing for me was, as someone who likes the red team, I was like, who better to protect the environment? Someone actually has a history on attacking. Now we have that visibility into the endpoints. So not only do we know that, oh, I have a problem, but now, CyberReason allows us to see the how, the why, and the when. CyberReason's deep hunting engine gives you deep visibility into endpoints. It automatically extracts statistical and behavioral analytics at a rate of 8 million queries per second on the data collected. CyberReason's technology can surface malicious operations without you writing a single rule. No more alert fatigue, no more huge log files. Learn more at CyberReason.com. And there's a, there's a notion that women are better than men at social engineering. Is that right? That one is, uh, statistically, it, 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 it makes perfect sense um, from, from what we see. Um, most of our social engineers that have a higher level of success rate are, are women. And the reason for that is, is typically culture. Uh, you know, it, it, it's usually women have much more of a, of a trusting uh, model than, than, than men. Now, that doesn't mean that, that it's the same across the board. Like, we have things that, that accents can play a big role. Like, southern accents here in the United States uh, typically have a higher probability of success when it comes to social engineering because the South, friendly, open, kind, uh, is, is usually what you find versus, like, New York, which is, like, you know, short and terse and, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, not mean, but uh, just more of a, a business-centric, fast-moving type of, of society. So, so culturally, cultural things can, can definitely have a major impact on the success of social engineering. With, with women specifically, um, we, it, 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 it's astonishing the highest level of success that you get um, with, with women because of what they're able to, to do, what they're able to see on the phone. And, you don't, and, and usually males do not have a tendency of thinking that they're being conned in some way, shape, or form. So I think uh, um, if you look at all of our successful social engineers, uh, a large pr- predominant amount of them have been women-driven. And, and Chris Inegi, uh from socialengineer.com, uh, uh, he also has an extremely high success rate with women as well as social engineers. And if you look at the last, um, I think it's like four or five uh, uh, SE villages that have been uh, that have happened at DEF CON and DerbyCon and, and, and the other ones, I think all of the winners have been women. 
Uh, so it's, 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 you see it continuously all over the place that, um, that women do make better, better social engineers than men, but it doesn't mean that, that men have a, a substantially hard trouble doing social engineering as well. It's just usually culturally from a, from a person perspective, uh, women have, a, have an easier time on that front. Uh, and that brings us to uh, the social engineering toolkit. Uh, tell us a bit about it. What is the social engineering toolkit? So the, the social engineer toolkit uh, originally started off with uh, a, an individual, Chris and Nagy and I from socialengineer.org. And it was like probably 2006, 2007 timeframes. And social engineering really wasn't being used um, much at all in technology. And uh, if you look at what you know, Kevin Mitnick in the 90s was able to accomplish with social engineering and technology, it was, it, it was a major threat. And it was something that we saw um, starting to go um, heavily increase. And so Chris and I uh, really decided to to try to bring a lot of awareness around uh, social engineering. And Chris was really the, the starting point of the social engineer framework and the podcast and everything else. And I started writing uh, the social engineer toolkit. And really the, the intent of, of the social engineer toolkit, and it's definitely morphed and expanded um, over years, was to bring awareness around social engineering and allow people to develop uh, social engineering attacks to test their effectiveness in their corporations uh, from a free tool um, that could allow you to, to very quickly stand up social engineering attacks to test how well you do against them. Give us an example of what uh, someone can do with the, the toolkit. Yeah, so you can, you can, um, you can uh, go into one of the attack vectors and you can clone uh, any website you want to. Uh, and, and let's just say you want to clone a Facebook site. Uh, you can clone a Facebook site and, uh, and try to harvest their credentials when they go to log in. It sets up everything for you, the web servers, everything that you need to do uh, to go and do it. Um, so it'll harvest credentials. Um, it can send emails that have attachments that are malicious that give you code execution like macros and things like that. Uh, it does PowerShell injection techniques that circumvent uh, most detection criteria, so it gets around a lot of the, the detection pieces that are out there. Um, there's a few other attacks like uh, launching code from a Java applet, launching code from an HDA attack. Uh, there's a number of different attacks in there that, that allow you to, to try to coax individuals into going to your site. But you still have to build the pretext or the, the attack that you have to do, like your scenario, your fantasy that you're doing, but the social engineer toolkit sets up all of the technological components that you need to be successful to deliver that. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a framework that allows you to create these, these tests very quickly um, and go and attack an organization to, to see how effective they are. And it's free to use. It's absolutely free. It's all open source and free. Uh, if you ever want to go through my code, it's probably horrible, but it works. <laughs> um, you're more than welcome to go through um, and, uh, and use it, but it's all free. I've, I've dedicated uh, probably seven years uh, to, or eight years to, to the social engineer toolkit, if not more. Uh, and it's, it's uh, I think at this point, I think we're at like, 50,000 lines of code and, and some other stuff, but it has a number of different uh, uh, attack portions in it. Uh, you can develop uh, devices that, that uh, like a, what's called a Tinsy device, where you can implant it into uh, keyboards. And so you ship somebody a keyboard out, it'll, it'll harvest their credentials and steal their username and password from their keyboard. I mean, there's, there's so many different things that you can do uh, inside of the Social Engineer Toolkit help you, to help you be successful in your, your attack. Did people send you like you know stories about how they used the the, the toolkit in, in successful operations uh, yeah yeah definitely we get we get success stories all the time on on the social engineer toolkit and, and how they leverage it in their company and and um, what they're going and using it for uh, it's been used in, in a lot of different things in fact it was actually used on the uh, the mr. robot TV show a couple of times as well um, so it's it's a, it's a it's an exploitation for a lot of people use it a lot of corporations use it uh, to test how well they do. Penetration testers use it. Uh, it's, it's something that, um, it, it's been a fun project that I continuously uh, work on, uh, among, amongst other, other projects, but the social engineer toolkit is probably my, my favorite. <laughs> and, and now you've got to tell us about Mr. Robot and how you became an advisor to that show. Yeah, well, so it's interesting. Uh, Mr. Robot uh, uh, employs a lot of, a lot of hackers um, to, to help, help out with the TV show itself. So, you know, there's, there's a number of folks that, that contributes um, to, to making Mr. Robot a success. And, and so what was funny is like the, the, very first, um, the very first season before it had even come out, uh, there was an a, uh, 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 email that we got in that basically said like, hey, uh, we're doing this new TV show uh, about hackers. Uh, can we use some of your information, like your tools? Can we use uh, some of your stuff? And, and what can we do to, um, to, to, to get help you know, on the show for, to portray hackers? And so we signed off on some waivers so they could use the social engineer toolkit and stuff like that. And I was working with one of the early um, tech folks and one of the, the uh, co-producers, his name is, well, Sam Eshmael is the, the main, main producer, but uh, um, uh, Sam, um, sorry, Cor- Corridana is the, the secondary producer, the technical person. And then there's a few folks kind of advising on the show then. 
And so they kind of came to me with a few different skits. Like there was one, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, with Mr. Robots and in season one, uh, there was a, during that, during around the same time, they tried to use live events and, uh, the Ashley Madison adult site got hacked at that time. And they had come out with a skit, um, that they didn't ultimately use, but I thought was really cool where, uh, they were going to have Elliot actually hack into and be the one that actually breached the Ashley Madison website. And so I, I developed a bunch of code <laughs> that made it look like it was hacking into the Ashley Madison database and extracting all of that. And then, uh, he was going to use that information to, um, expose his, his shrinks, uh, boyfriend or whatever that was was really like a, a bad dude or something like that and so uh it was kind of cool um but in season one episode five um they used the social engineer toolkit to uh to hack into evil corp by by sending a, a spoof text message uh saying that it's what we always feared you're you're um i'm in the hospital now and so it got elliot into into steel uh into steel mountain to, to hack into them <laughs> in season three or season two episode one or season season three episode one uh, Darlene used, uh, uh, the social engineer toolkit to deploy ransomware. Uh, Mark Rogers actually did the, the skit for that one, but used the social engineer toolkit for it. And then, um, one of my favorite ones is, is in, in this last season here. Uh, 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 Corradana, uh, did a, a special shout out, uh, to me. So Elliot was actually, uh, getting, getting, uh, uh, booted out of Evil Corp and he was trying to, to stop these hackers from taking down the company. And, uh, he had to use social engineer his way to stay in the building itself. And so he sees these guards um, over on the, the left-hand side. And so he walks into a business meeting that he's not supposed to be at. And the, the, the business person who's like the head of VP of sales is like, hey, uh, I'm sorry, who are you and why are you here? And he's like, sorry, just one second. I'm in, I'm in an email, very important. And he's like, and so the, the sales guy's like, who are you? I'm like, oh, he's like, oh, I'm Dave Kennedy. I work with uh, Craig on the Q4 push. I had much, a lot more hair there. So they actually name dropped me on the TV show, which I thought was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much fun. <laughs> oh, so cool. You know, it, it was very humbling, uh, you know, to, to the Core's uh, piece. You know, Core gave me a heads up like a, a year before that they were going to do something like that. But I didn't know what it was going to be. And, and uh, it was just so so nice of them. And, and you know, what I what I really respect about that show is that, um, they're one of the few shows that I've ever seen. In fact, I think it's probably the only one that I've ever seen that tries to, to accurately portray what's possible through hacking and they have a huge amount of love and respect uh, for the community that we have. And, and, and the people that work on this show are, are just amazing folks. Um, some of the folks over at Tanium work there and, and do a lot of work and, and do most of the, the skits there. Um, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing that they, they were able to accomplish with the, the, the TV show. And, and Rami Malek is, is, just an amazing actor. And obviously Christian Slater is, is well-known actor. Um, it's, it's just really cool to see how they were able to bring all that together and then throw so many different, uh, tidbits in, uh, for information to, to really, um, bring it all through. And I just think that, that those, those folks there on that TV show just did an amazing job. It was, it was really neat. It was humbling. It was, it was cool. Um, you know, all my, all my family members were like, well, you know, I had friends on, on Twitter, you know, shouting out and going crazy. Uh, it was, it was really neat. And, uh, I think uh, it was really a cool testament to what we've accomplished in the security industry. It must be very cool to see your creation on the screen that way. And uh, talking of seeing your creation being used by others, was the, sto- the social engineering toolkit ever used by bad guys? You know, we, we haven't had any direct reports of it, but I'm sure it has. Um, w- this is a great discussion because obviously I write tools that, that are designed to hack into computer systems. Uh, one of my tools is called Unicorn. Uh, which is a uh, PowerShell exploitation framework that, that circumvents detection criteria. And so people would be like, well, why are you writing these tools that could get around uh, Windows Windows Defender or antivirus or things that we have out there? Isn't that giving uh, a, you know attackers the same thing? And my, my philosophy on this is, is very, very clear. Uh, it, the, the, the folks that are doing the malicious hacking, um, it's, it's an ethical issue where they're trying to make monetary gain or their nation states trying to gain intelligence or they're they're doing something nefarious, right? And they already have the sophistication and the tools out there to do what they need to do to operate. So if the, if the good folks don't have that same type of, of, of way of testing to see what can happen, then we're, we're very much behind the curve when it comes to being able to defend against these attacks. And so my whole purpose for releasing things like the Social Engineer Toolkit is obviously for the, for the point of good and to give people the ability to really simulate and test because there's only a small number of us if you look at demographics of the security industry that can even program or code these types of, of attacks, it's, it's a fairly small uh, uh, percentage of, of the overall security population. So our, our goal is to really give information to people to be able to do the right thing. And yes, it could be used uh, in a malicious fashion, but at the same time, if, if we don't have access to it, then we're, we're literally going to be um, caught off guard. And a good example of this um, is a lot of the tools that I write um, 
get, gets a lot of popularity. And so like security products will try to write signatures or, or detection criteria for it. But the stuff that I never write or that I never publish never gets detected. And so the, the, right now the industry really is focusing on, well, what's known and, and, and attackers don't like to publish their code. Attackers don't like to say, well, hey, I'm going to upload this to virus total so that every single antivirus vendor out there of knows and can write signatures for us. And so it's, it's, it's more so a, the ability to, to uh, give information to people to be able to test it in a way that, that stimulates those. And it really is up to organizations to try to build defenses against those attacks. And I think that's really where the, the my, my mindset is from that side. So definitely it's been used before, I'm sure, in the past for, for malicious purposes. Definitely not the intent. Uh, but, if, you know, you, you give somebody a hammer and it can be used for something good and it can be used for something bad. Uh, it's really uh, that, that principle that, that drives me for, for the coding and what I, what I release. Yeah, I mean, uh, I encourage listeners who are, you know, are curious of, of uh, social engineering and its, its power in their organization to have a look at, at this, the, the, the toolkit. I mean, it's very powerful, extremely powerful. With a click of a button, I mean, a few menu choices, and you'll, you can do amazing stuff. Uh, Dave Kennedy, thank you very much for joining us uh, in this interview. It was great fun. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, if anybody has any questions, if you, if you get any questions from some, some of your audience, I'm uh, happy to, uh, to answer them and, uh, and anything they can do to help out. And uh, if you're interested in, in getting into this field and penetration testing, uh, I wrote a book. It's a couple years old, but it's definitely good from a, a reading perspective. It's called, uh, it's, it's, I, co- I co-wrote it with uh, a couple of folks from the, um, the Cali Linux uh, crew, uh, Mutz and uh, Dookie and, and um, uh, um, uh, Jim O'Gorman, uh, we, we wrote a book called Metasploit, the Penetration Tester's Guide, and it was a, basically a way to kind of frame your mind in a way to attack an organization and to think about an organization and to, to do the technology piece behind it. So, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, it's, it's a great uh, career. There's a huge shortage of people in the information security space, and uh, we're always looking for people. So really appreciate you having me on and, and uh, appreciate everything that you do and to, to get information out there to everybody. It's, it's uh, totally my pleasure. And the book, I, I'm guessing it's available via Amazon or even your, your site. Is it on your site as yep. well? Fantastic. Uh, Meta, uh, you, if you just look up Metasploit on, on Amazon, you'll see it. Uh, it's uh, the first hit on there. Fantastic. And, uh, all yours. Thank yeah. you very much, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Hang on, hang on. That's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. You're invited to follow Dave on Twitter at at HackingDave, and you can find the Social Engineering Toolkit on GitHub. Send me your social engineering stories to ran at ranlevy.com. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I.com. Or on Twitter at at ranlevy, and I'll be happy to share them with our listeners on future episodes. Follow at Malicious Life for updates on future episodes as they become available. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. Thanks again to CyberReason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye.